Had some great things happen here at Life Source yesterday. We had a food distribution for our Hope and Freedom Pantry. That was a marvelous, marvelous time. Hundreds of bags of groceries were given away, and, and God's opening up some doors for us to get involved with the Maryland Food Bank. So that's going to increase the food that's coming in here in a great way. So we're excited about that. Yesterday afternoon, we had some fireworks here in the sanctuary with our political uh, campaign town hall meetings. It was awesome. Thank you so much for those that came out and participated. We believe it's so important for the church to get involved in politics and, and let our voice be heard. God is, it, God is government. And a lot of people subscribe to the theory that, that God is anti-government. He isn't. He's the chief lawgiver, judge, and the executive. He's the king. And so our very form of government was was founded after who God is in Isaiah 33, 22. Also want to let you know about a couple other things on October the 11th. You'll hear about this coming up over the next couple of weeks. But Life Source is a, is a sending church. And uh, it's, Pastor Mike says it to you all the time. He wants to get you out of here and, and send you to other places and help the kingdom expand because the kingdom is bigger than 7,000 Rossville Boulevard. And the kingdom is, is anywhere that God rules is the kingdom of God. So we're going to be a part, and we're working together already with a new church plant. And it's a church called Liberation Church. We'll be planting in Bowie, Maryland. And we're excited about that. Our, our Acts Bible School is working uh, as part of this, so they'll be helping plant the church. But on October the 11th, a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a vision night for Liberation Church. Uh, Bishop James Azard will be pastoring and planting the church. You've heard him speak here before, and uh, he'll, he'll be here sharing the vision. So we'd love for you to come out on Tuesday the 11th and hear about this church plant, and maybe the Lord will put it on your heart to want to be a part of it. And there's multiple ways that you can do that. So mark that date down, October the 11th at 7 o'clock. And last but not least, there's a group from here that went to Kentucky last year that helped uh, when there was massive tornadoes that went through and helped to rebuild. And uh, so there's a group going again, um, coming up this fall to Kentucky to help continue the work. Because a lot of times when a big disaster happens, there's an initial push to put money and energy and work into it. But how many of you know it doesn't all get fixed in 30 days? Things linger and people forget about it. So there's a group gonna go back to Kentucky again and help. So if you're interested in that or learning more about that, t t text the word Kentucky to the church phone number, 410. 391 8000 and we'll get some more information to you about what's happening and when it is and all those details. Amen? There's good stuff happening in the house. Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 and 9 says, Oh Lord, you induced me and I was persuaded. Think about a woman getting ready to be in labor. She gets induced. The process gets started. Something happens that, that can't stop. Oh Lord, you've induced me and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted violence and plunder because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. When a prophetic word comes, it isn't always things are gonna be marvelous and spectacular for you. Sometimes the prophetic word is a warning saying you better get yourself right. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Is, is the word, you know. Uh, verse 9 it says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah said, you know what? I'm tired of people not liking me for declaring the word of the Lord that they don't like, so I'm going to shut up. I'm not going to say it anymore. I'm not going to speak the word out, he said. But the scripture says, But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shot up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Today we're going to talk about the message title is The Zeal of God. Father, we thank you for this great day today. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for an expectation, an anticipation, Lord, of what you're doing, what you've already done, but what you want to do in this moment. Lord, so we present ourselves to you, Lord. We, we come before you and say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Lord, we say, here I am, Lord. Send me, use me. Put your word in my mouth. I'll speak, Lord. And I pray that you would consume us with the zeal and the fire and the passion of God here in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so Jeremiah said the word was like fire that was inside of him, he couldn't hold it back. It was, it was coming out like a volcanic eruption. There's nothing that can stop that when it, when it comes out. He wanted to stop it. He wanted to hold it back because people didn't like what he was saying. The Lord's going to destroy this place. 
Lord, I don't want to say this anymore. He was punished and persecuted because of the prophetic words that he spoke, but he couldn't keep quiet because the word was in him like fire. It, it was an overflowing of what God was doing on the inside of him, and it had to come out. It had to come out, and that, that overflowing is, is like zeal. Zeal, the definition of zeal is a great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. So a, a great energy or a great enthusiasm, it's an eagerness or an interest in the pursuit of something, a fervor. You know people that are, that are excited, that are full of fervor and zeal and passion about something. They're very easy to spot. You'll see a lot of them at stadiums all across the, the United States today in various football games. You'll see people full of zeal. You'll see them full of, of passion and fire and in this urgent, urgent desire to see something happen. And, and it was like a, a, a fire that, that had to come out of him. And uh, I want to ask you if you're familiar with this. There's something called the, the tortilla challenge. Anybody heard of this before? If you heard of this, raise your hand. I wanted to, just a few. I'm surprised there's not many. So, so um, this is a very interesting thing, this tortilla challenge. And, and how it works is, is two people are in a competition with each other. And they, they, they face off. And if you do this, I'd recommend having a tarp or, or doing it outside. But what they do is, is two people face each other. And then they take a big swig of water, right? So they take a big stick and mouth, mouth full of water. And then what you do is you take this tortilla, one person at a time, and you slap the daylights out of the other person with the tortilla. And so you, you swing and you as hard as you can. And, and what happens is, is the first one to spit their water out loses. And, and usually it happens like in the first round. You know, because it's just so funny to see somebody like just wail and just pow. And it's, it's a tortilla. It's just like getting hit with a feather. But it's a very interesting thing. And when I was thinking about Jeremiah saying that the word was like fire inside of him, it had to come out. I thought of the tortilla challenge, right? Because, because if you fill your mouth up with water, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to swallow it, but I, I spared you. But that, that, that water, it, it has to come out. And, and that's what Jeremiah was saying was like the, the zeal of God, the fire of God that's inside of me. It's a word that, that it has to come out of me, the, the zeal of God. And another word for zeal in, in Scripture is the word jealousy. Zeal and jealousy go, go hand in hand together. Um, Exodus chapter 34, 13, you may not have heard this before, but it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. So another word for zeal is jealous, and God is jealous for you. He's jealous for your time. He's jealous for your attention. He's jealous for your focus. He's jealous for your worship. That's why no idol will stand before him, because he's jealous for us. And when you find a jealous man, that man will not stop at anything to, to avenge his jealousy. And so God is a, a jealous God, and, and he's, he's full of this passion and, and zeal and, and jealousy for us. And in contrast to zeal, think of apathy. Think of apathy. Think of someone that, that lacks concern or emotion, depression, a lack of interest. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of the church is today, in this place of depression. In this place of apathy, uh, say la vie, whatever will be, will be. I guess this was meant to be what happens. And how many are excited to follow an apathetic person? Man, your life is so boring and so mundane. I'd love to follow you. Give me, give me what you have. What is it that you think that I have? zeal and, and, and apathy. So, so we've got to move away from being apathetic and be full of the zeal and the, the fire and the passion of God. And uh, no one is attracted to that apathetic person. Uh, but people full of zeal, they attract people. When you find somebody passionate about something, you might not even know where they're going, but you'll follow them. Because there's something about this life and this joy that it overflows from people. And, and you, you want to be a part of what's, what's going on with them. But I want to look back in Scripture about where I really see the, the zeal of God first demonstrated. 
In, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, God was in the midst of a, a, a total earth makeover, right? It, it, was, it was in shambles. It was, it was out of order and in chaos. And so God had to, to fix things up. In verse 8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in the Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. So God made a beautiful garden. He set man and Adam and Eve in this garden to, to tend it and take care of it. And verse 15, it says, then, then the Lord God took to the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the, the, the desire that they had and the desire that we have when we get set up is that from that point on, everything would be happily ever after. So God put Adam and Eve in the garden, tend it, take care of it, and, and we'd like the story that it's written and happily ever after. Everything worked out just perfectly from then, that point forward, and we like that story in our families. Husband, wife had mar got married, had kids, and everybody lived happily ever after. And, and, and in our churches, and, and we worship God and love Jesus, and everybody lived happily ever after. And in our nation, we set up our, our form of government, honor God and Christian principles, and we live happily ever after. How many of you know it doesn't work like that? We, we have this desire for everything to just, just go smoothly, but, but the enemy is a thief. And he comes not only, only, but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his desire, that's his plan, that's his strategy. And what's a thief do but steal something that belongs to you? If, if, it, if he wasn't stealing anything, if it didn't belong to you, you wouldn't care. But the thief comes to, to steal, kill, and destroy what belongs to you. So the, the thief showed up in the garden and stole from Adam and Eve what belonged to them. This relationship that God had set up with them. This right and authority that God had given them on the earth. The enemy came in and stole from them. And God is a jealous God. So he gets mad when the enemy steals from you. When the enemy steals from us, when the enemy comes and takes from us, God gets angry and God gets upset. Much like a man in Proverbs chapter 6, when, when somebody comes and steals his wife from him. Verse 32 says, Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonors he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no more recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give him many gifts. So somebody comes and, and has an affair with your wife, husband, there's nothing that's going to satisfy you until revenge is taken out on that person. No gifts, no, I'm sorry, can we make a deal? Here's, here's some money. Nothing satisfies that jealousy. And God is the same way about us. When the enemy comes and steals from us, there's an anger that rises up in God and nothing is going to satisfy that anger, that jealousy, that zeal, except vengeance on the enemy. So Adam and Eve got stolen from in the garden and, and God punished the enemy because of it. Why? Because God's a jealous God and he's full of zeal for his people. Genesis 3.14 says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are, cur are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and, and you shall bruise his heel. God is a, a jealous God, full of zeal, because he's jealous for us. He, he carried out vengeance on the enemy. He, he issued this sentence of, of, of you're going to crawl on your belly, and you'll be more cursed than any and all animals, and you're going to eat dust. Why? Because he messed with us. The zeal of God. God is a jealous God, is full of zeal. And you and I can either partner with God in this zeal and in this jealousy for his purposes, or we can sit back and watch the enemy steal. God's looking for people that will partner with him in his zeal. People that will partner with him in his jealousy for his purposes and for his plan. Or we can just hide back and say, you know what? If, 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 I, if I keep quiet, maybe the enemy will go away. If I, if, I, if I just hide over here, maybe he won't take my joy and my peace anymore. If I just 
stay unnoticed, maybe he won't mess with my kids anymore. And, and the enemy isn't, isn't satisfied with your quietness. Because you know what he does? He takes advantage of that. An easy target. God's looking for people that, that will partner with him to fulfill his purposes and bring vengeance on his enemies. So we're going to dig into a story of, here about a man that, that partnered with God to bring about vengeance on his enemies. And it's the man Elijah. Elijah was a man full of the zeal and the passion of God. Think about him on, on top of Mount Carmel, setting up this altar and saying, pour more water on it, pour more water on it, and, and watch God show up by fire and consume this altar. We'll pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 19 and, and verse 14. Uh, Elijah had this great victory, and then he was discouraged. Just a warning, many times after you have a great victory, discouragement's right at the door. So, so he, he went out, and he, he, he got a threat from Jezebel, so he's running away, and he's scared for his life. In verse 14 of 1 Kings 19, and he said, I've been very zealous for the God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. You ever feel like you're the only one left? The only one standing, the only one that's believing, the only one that, that's going to fight for God's purposes. So Elijah's complaining to the Lord, and the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholech, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. So God's saying, I'm, you know what? I'm going to have vengeance on my enemies. And Elijah, what I want to do is I want to partner with you to raise up those warriors, to raise up those that are going to bring about judgment. Whoever Haziel doesn't kill, Jehu will. And whoever Jehu doesn't kill, Elisha will. So I want to partner with you to, to raise these people up, to prepare them, to bring judgment on my enemies because God's a jealous God. And he's going to have vengeance on his enemies, but he needs us to partner with him. In order for the enemy's plans to be destroyed, God has to have you as a partner to do it. So he had to have Elijah, even in the midst of his complaining, you know what, I need you. I need you to partner with me so that this purpose can, can prevail. So God was working on some people to get them ready for his purposes. Are, are you a candidate that God can use? Are you somebody that, that God can work on to get ready to bring vengeance on his enemies? Amen. Amen. So, so we're picked, and we're prepared, and we're anointed, and we're made ready to bring vengeance on God's enemies. And God's working, and he's raising people up, and, and there's a process that's involved with that, with that growth and with that maturity, and that's happening. So, so God's moving even when we don't see he's moving. He's preparing an answer before we, we ever know that, that the answer's being worked on. There's a tremendous testimony on uh, September the 26th, 2020. There was an event at the mall in, in Washington, D.C., and it was called The Return. And we were there praying for the sin of this nation, for all the babies that have been murdered. We were crying out to God, saying, God, please forgive us, Lord. We're, take this stain, take this bloodshed away from us. And so we're, we're crying and crying and crying and praying. And the event was supposed to end at 5 p.m. that day on September the 26th, and it didn't. It went four minutes over. So it went to 5.04. And at 5.04, all the Jewish rabbis got up onto the platform and blew their shofar horns. And a shofar horn blowing is a sign of victory. It's a sign of God moving. It's a sign, like, think of Gideon when they blew the horns, like the enemies scattered when the horns were, were blown. So at that very moment, at 5.04, um, not that far from the, the mall in D.C., at that moment, at 5.04 in the Rose Garden, there was an announcement made of the next Supreme Court justice because the, the one had died a few, about 10 days earlier, and on that day, September the 26th, at 5.04, here's the announcement of the next Supreme Court justice. Then, then over as time unfolds, it seemed like abortion was getting more accessible 
over the last couple of years. Like it, look, the infanticide bills and different things we, we, we dealt with here in this church about resisting those things. But it seemed like things were getting worse. But then God, God had already had a plan. Because the very, when the shofar horns were blown, it was saying, this is the victory that's coming. This is, this God's moving. God, something's happening right now. And the zeal of God will perform. And even though we don't see it, even though we can't understand what's happening behind the scenes, how's God moving? But at 504, the very judge that was announced was the very judge who cast the vote just a couple of months ago that ended and overturned Roe versus Wade. That, that's, that's the zeal of God, and that's, that's God working when you don't see him working. When, when Elijah's looking around and saying, I'm the only one left. There's nobody here. They're, they're tearing down your altars. There's nothing happening. And God said, hold up. I, I, I'm not done yet. I, I'm still working. I'm still, you might not understand it. It might not be on your timetable, but understand I'm still working because the zeal of God, the jealousy of God, it will accomplish his purposes. So verse Kings chapter 21, it says, and it came to pass after these things. It came to pass after these things. After what things? After God had already started working. After God had started raising up people that he was partnering with. After God had raised up the next king and a prophet. After God was working. But after these things, that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I might have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near next to my house, and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. So Naboth, this man, had a, had a vineyard right next to Ahab's castle. And, and, and Ahab came to him and said, Hey, give me that. Give me that vineyard. I want to make it for a vegetable garden. It'll, look, it'll be a nice addition to our, our landscaping plot here. It'll be great before and after pictures. We'll put a gazebo in there. We'll do all these things. Make it beautiful. And, and, Na, and Naboth is very interesting what his name means. Naboth's name means words and prophecies. So the evil king came to Naboth and said, Give me your words and your prophecies. And I'll give you something better in exchange. I'll give you money. I'll give you a better vineyard. I'll give you something better. So exchange the promise of God for something better was the deal the enemy was trying to make with him. And a vineyard in Scripture, it represents God taking care of us. That's what a vineyard stands for. So this this word and prophecy about God taking care of us. So the enemy was trying to make a deal just as he's trying to make a deal with us. Hey, give me your words. Give me your promises. Give me those things that God has said he's going to promise to take care of you. And in exchange, I'll give you something better. I'll give you money. I'll give you something in exchange of these things. And, 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 and we, we face this decision. Will you accept something else that maybe looks more appealing Or will you stand firm on the promises of God that God said he's going to take care of me? So I'm going to stand firm on that promise. So Ahab was was in verse 3, but but Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. And I pray that that would be our stance, men and women of God, that we say, you know what, the Lord forbid that I give his promises to you. If we don't have the promises of God, what do we have? So Ahab was unhappy and moping around and complaining. He won't give me his vineyard. Stinking Naboth. And so so his wife shows up, Jezebel, verse 7. Then Then Jezebel's wife said to him, you now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with the seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and and seat Naboth with high honor among the people. And then seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. Skip down to verse 15. And it came to pass when Jezebel 
or Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, the enemy that, that Ahab got up, went down, and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. We, we, we want everything to work out just fine. I'm going to stand against the enemy, and I'm not going to give up my promises of God, and he's going to go away. But the enemy came and killed him and stole that ground. There's some people in here today that the enemy has stolen from you. There's things that have been taken. There's promises that have been taken. And you, you've been standing firm, believing God that, that nothing like this was going to happen. But it happened anyway. How do we put that together? How do we understand what God's doing? But, but his ways are so much higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And even when we don't understand how he's working, he's working. Let's see how this story unfolds. Verse 17, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, standing in the promises of God, where he's gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Verse 27, God's going to have vengeance on his enemies. He's a jealous God. Somebody messes with you, watch what happens to them. Verse 27, so it was when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he's humbled himself before me, I will not bring calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring calamity on his house. So God is so full of mercy that even when Ahab begged for mercy, God was willing to extend it to a wicked man. God is, is, is extremely merciful beyond what we are. But God needs a partner to carry out his vengeance on his enemies. He brought this word, you know what, I'm going to destroy Ahab. I'm going to destroy Jezebel. And you know what, all of their seed as well. So Naboth got his promises stolen. He thought, man, you're watching like, man, God, God let them down. I thought that he was, gonna, he was standing firm on his promises that everything was going to be secure, that, that he would be confident in, in God's vineyard and everything's going to be okay. But God was working behind the scenes on a much bigger plot that, that, that they didn't understand in the moment. So 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 14, remember this man Jehu? He's one that Elijah anointed. He was one that was being prepared before these things. So God was working on, my pl on his plan way before any of this happened. Verse 14 of 2 Kings chapter 9. So Jehu, and Jehu's name means he is God. Because God's looking for a partnership. And when we partner with God, we're acting on behalf of God. So when Jehu showed up, you know who showed up? God showed up. You know when you show up and you're in partnership with God, who showed up? God just showed up right in the midst of that circumstance. God showed up. Why? Because he's in a partnership with you. And when you show up on behalf of him, God's showing up. If there's two people in a business partnership relationship, when, when one of them showed up, the business just showed up. The, the, the arrangement just showed up. So Jehu, whose name means he is God, just showed up into the circumstance. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Who was Joram? Ahab's son. Verse 16, so Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel for Joram was laid up there. He went to go bring vengeance on God's behalf to the son of Ahab. And ah Ahaziah, king of Judah, had come down to see Joram. Now a watchman stood on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came. And, and he said, I see a company of men. 
They're looking from the tower, the king's watchtower, watching the, the, this group of men come towards the tower. And Joram said, get a horseman and send him, send him meet them and let him say, is it peace? So, so Jehu, it is God coming on behalf of God. Can, can we make a deal? Can we sign a peace treaty? Can we, can we settle this matter without any, any undue loss here? So the horseman went to meet him and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, what do you have to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. Because somebody full of zeal, people want to follow them. People want to fall in line with somebody that's full of zeal and full of passion. So the watchman reported saying, the messenger went to them, but he's not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, thus says the king, is it peace? Can we make a deal? Can we settle this thing? And Jehu answered, what do you have to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the king's messenger now is following Jehu, a bring vengeance on God's enemies. The wicked turn on each other. There's no honor amongst thieves. Verse 20, so the watchman reported, he went up to them and is not coming back. And, and he's driving, the, the one that's driving is driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. So this guy had a reputation. You know, the, the, Vin Diesel wasn't the first Fast and the Furious. The first Fast and the Furious was Jehu in his chariot, right? So, so he's riding furiously. He's riding full of passion. Why? Because he's God, and he's a jealous God, and he's coming to bring vengeance on his enemies. And they're like, this guy looks like Jake. This looks like God's coming. Verse 21, then Jerome said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out to meet Jehu and met him on the property, an interesting place to meet, on the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. They had a meeting on the promises of God. Now it happened when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? Can, can we make a deal? Can we settle this? I'll give you something better. Then the promises of God. So he answered, what peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. What deal can we make with the enemy? There's no deals. Verse 23, then Joram turned around and fled and said to Hezekiah, treachery, Hezekiah. Now Jehu drew his bow with full strength and shot Jehoram between his arms. And the arrow came out of his heart and he sank down in his chariot. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, pick him up and throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember when you and I were riding together behind Ahab, his father, that the Lord had laid this burden upon him? Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this plot, says the Lord. Now therefore take and throw him on the plot of ground according to the word of the Lord. Lord say, can I, can I have a partner? Can I have somebody that will work with me to bring vengeance on the enemy? Can I have somebody that's full of zeal, somebody that's full of passion, somebody that's full of jealousy for the things of God that we can partner together in to bring vengeance on the enemy? Or is it, is, is this peace that you come? Can we, we, we don't need to fight. Sometimes we need to fight. 2 Kings chapter 9, it isn't done yet. No, no, verse 30, now, when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. So she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. Trying to, so the, the, enemy, the, the enemy comes as an angel of light. How can I pretty this thing up? She's getting her makeup on. She wants to seduce, seduce this man. Then Jehu, as he entered the, at the gate, she, she said, is it peace, Zimri, murder of your master? Jehu, are you coming in peace? Can we make a deal? And he looked up at the window and said, who's on my side? Who? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him, and then they said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. And then when he, got, then, then, when he had gone in, he ate and drank. You know, that, this is a bad dude right here. The, the woman just got thrown out of the wall, her blood splattered all over, trampled over by horses. He's like, you know what? I'm hungry. 
I need a snack. Right? So, so he came inside, and then, he, then he, he came back out. Then he said, go now, see to this accursed woman, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than her skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they came back and told him, and he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, on the plot of ground that Jezreel dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. How many of you know the promises of God? They're going to come about. They're going to be fulfilled. It just might be on a bigger level and a bigger understanding than you possibly had an idea. Because if, if Naboth could have just stood still on his land and, and not interfered and just, just let the enemy leave me alone, God had a bigger plan to destroy all of his enemies, destroy all of our enemies, because his thoughts are way higher than our thoughts. But he needs somebody to say, you know what? I'll partner with you, God. I'll do it. Lord, I'll say that. I'll, I want to be a part of what you're doing. Verse 37, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be refused on the surface of the field in the plot of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, here lies Jezebel. She's gone. Chapter 10, Ahab continued, or Jehu continued to bring about the word of God. He killed all of Ahab's 70 sons destroyed all them, killed all his family. And you know what else he did? He tricked all the enemies, all the Baal worshipers there. He said, you know what? I want to worship Baal with you. Let's get a big ceremony together and get all the Baal worshipers together in one place so we can all celebrate the goodness of Baal. So he got them all in the same place and then he put guards at the doors and then all the Baal worshipers were killed all at one time because God's a jealous God and he's going to have his way with his enemies. But he needs somebody to partner with him. If there was no Jehu, if there was nobody to say, I'm partnering with God, God's purposes couldn't be prevailed. God's purposes couldn't happen in that day until he has a partner. He needs you and I to say, here I am, Lord. I'm available for your purposes. Too many of us are saying, if, if we just keep quiet, if we just try not to be seen, then, then, then the enemy won't steal from us anymore. If you don't know there's a battle, you're losing it. The enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There's no peace treaties. Is it peace? What peace can there be as long as the harlotries of Jezebel are in the land? As long as babies are being aborted? How, how can there be peace? There's no peace. We need to bring about the judgment, judgment and justice of God on his enemies. And he needs people that are full of zeal, that are full of the passion of God, that are full of his purposes. When we pray, we should pray with fire. We should pray with a loud declaration. We should pray with a shout. Our prayer shouldn't be like this. Our prayer should be declarative. Our prayer should be, God, if God's for me, who can be against me? Let's go get the enemy. And so many times, we're just asleep. And we're being robbed. And the enemy's stealing from us. But we need to be people that are full of the zeal of the Lord, like Jehu, that when the enemy sees you coming, hey, Whoever's coming, they're riding furiously. They're coming. And, and when we, the battle's not even ours, it's the Lord's. So when we praise him, when we lift up his name, the enemy's scattered. That's our weapons, the weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the tearing down of strongholds. Using the declarations, using the faith, using the power that he's given us is how we can execute judgment on the enemies. Would you stand on your feet with me this morning? Did you understand this today? The zeal of God has to consume us. Psalms chapter 69 verse 9 says, Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the approaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. God's looking for people that are jealous for him, that are jealous for his purposes. Think about when Jesus showed up in the temple. And they were, there was all this other activity going on, all this dishonest exchanging of money. And something rose up inside of him 
the zeal of God, fire shot up in his bones. And he said, you've turned this house of prayer into a den of thieves. Why? Because he was passionate for the house of God, for the purposes of God. And because of that, he had to act. He had to do something in our lives, in our families. When we see the enemy show up, we can't just observe it. We have to say, you know what? I'm jealous for the house of God. I'm jealous for the purposes of God. This isn't going to stand anymore. We're not going to let this happen anymore. We're going to lift up a standard. We're not going to let compromise come in. We're not going to let sin come in. We're not going to let lust come in. We're not going to let these things come in. Why? Because I'm full of zeal for the purposes and plan and, and all promises that God has given us. God needs some Jehus. Some people say, you know what? I'm not afraid. Let's go. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. It's not you. I've been reading this book this week that's blown my mind by Smith Wigglesworth. Great, great, great man of God. And he talked about the scripture that, that in, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence. And he stopped right there and he said, what is the kingdom of God suffering violence? What violence can there be against God? Well, the kingdom of God is any place where God rules. So we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. So in our life, when we surrender it to God, it becomes part of the kingdom of God. So how does the kingdom suffer violence? It suffers violence when the enemy comes and brings sickness. When the enemy comes and brings doubt. When the enemy comes and brings fear. When the enemy comes and brings worry. When the enemy comes and brings dissension. When the enemy comes and tempts. When the enemy comes, that's in you. The kingdom of God is suffering violence. But what do the, what do the righteous do? The righteous take it by force. You know what? I no longer accept this. Body be made well. Mind be made right. Because I'm in partnership with God. God is working with me and we, we bring jealousy. We bring the zeal of God for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in our life, in our city, in our nation. Lord, would you move in this place today? Lord, would you move in us? Lord, that we wouldn't just sit idly by and watch things get stolen from us, but Lord, we would be those who take it by force and say, no, I'm jealous for the purposes of God. I'm jealous for the purposes of God in my family. I'm jealous for the purposes of God in my finances. I'm jealous for God's work to be done in this city. I'm jealous for it. And I'm not just going to give up without a fight. Oh, I'm going to declare with power and the authority that God's given me. God, let there be a fight that rises up inside of us. Psalms 119, 139 says, My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Lord, let us remind them of their end. Let us remind them of your words. Let us remind them of your promises. Right here in this place, I want you to Close your eyes just for a moment. God's looking for people that will partner with Him. Let's say, Lord, I, I, I surrender my life to You. Lord, I want to live for You. Lord, I want to be in this partnership. But there's no par partnership with God without surrender to God. There can't be two kings on the throne. It's either Him or you that's on the throne of your life. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, I, I need Jesus as Lord of my life. I've never come into this relationship. I've never surrendered to him. And the enemy's just having his way in my life, in my family. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day you can be free. Or maybe you've known him and you've, you've turned, you've, you've, you've walked away. There, you haven't been in relationship with him. He tells us to work out our salvation daily with fear and trembling. This isn't just a, I got saved one time as a kid. Nope. This is something we walk out every day. So if you're here today and you say, you know what? I, I want Jesus as Lord of my life. I want to surrender to him. I want you to raise your hand. Say, that's me. I want to come in partnership with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want Jesus in my life. I see that hand up there. 
I see the hands down here. That's awesome. That's awesome. I want us to pray together. All together. Say, Jesus, come into my life and save me. I want to live for you every day of my life. I ask that you would forgive me of my sin. Make me clean. I want to come into partnership with you. I believe that you died for me to pay the price for my sin. And I want to live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's rejoice in that all of heaven rejoices when one soul comes into the kingdom. I want to pray one other prayer. And so many times we, we can fall asleep. I heard a man recently say that we don't know we're asleep until we wake up. You never know when you fall asleep. You just knew you were sleeping when you woke up. So there's a lot of people that are, are at, at ease in Zion. They're asleep. Not really recognizing what the enemy's doing. Not really aware that there's an attack. Not really aware that they're being taken advantage of. And I want you to wake up today. So if you want a touch from God in your life, you, you want a stirring to, to happen. You want that, that, that zeal that was in Jehu to be in you. Just lift your hands all over this room. Let's lift our hands and say, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come? Just cry out to Him for a moment. Holy Spirit, come. 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 Consume. Holy Spirit, come and 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 consume. I surrender to you. I surrender to you. Oh, I pray the zeal of God would consume you. The zeal of God oh, would be like that fire shot up in your bones. Oh, the fear of God, the zeal of God, the presence of God, the awareness of God, the awareness of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, when you come and move, we surrender to you. We want to be in partnership with you. Oh, we want to be people that are led by the Spirit, not by the lust of our flesh. Open us up. Open us up. Open us up, Lord, to hear you. Lord, I pray for clarity in our hearing. Lord, that you would cause clogged ears to be unclogged in this environment. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here today. Move all throughout this church. Move from person to person. Move in this atmosphere. I thank you that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty and there's freedom. Oh, we thank you in this place. Have your way. Have your way. Oh, a fresh touch of the zeal of God. Holy Spirit, come and consume Holy Spirit, come and invade. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Holy Spirit, come. 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 I just see it as you're crying out. As you cry out, the enemy's looking. The enemy's looking. Who's on that chariot? Who's advancing? Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Oh, we cry out to you today. Oh, God, would you move in this place? Would you move in our hearts? Would you move? We surrender to you. We surrender to your will. We surrender to your plan. We surrender to your purpose. Let there be a divine partnership. Oh, let us move from a place of apathy. Oh, into a place of passion. Oh, to a place of desperateness. Oh, to a place where there's a cry. Oh, we cry out. Oh, let your word be like fire that shut up in our bones. It's got to come out. Just for another minute, cry out. We cry out. King of glory. Have vengeance on your enemies.
I believe that there's there's some hungry people here today. There's a hunger. So what I want to do is is we want to do our declarations, and if you need to go, you can go. You're dismissed once we do that. But if you're hungry for God and you want to touch, think of it like one candle is lit from the fire from another candle. You want to touch from God today. He wants to touch you. Holy Spirit wants to come and infuse you with power, infuse you with a fresh touch of His Holy Spirit. So if you're here today after we do the declarations, come on down to the altar. We'll pray for you and just believe that, that you'll wake up, that there'll be a, 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 an overwhelming fire inside of you. God's looking for some Jehus some people that will ride with him to carry out his purposes and see the enemy be destroyed so lift up your hands with me today i want you to declare with me i'm saved i'm healed i'm delivered change is here and i'm full of the zeal of god in my life god bless you thank you for joining us at life source church we pray that today you found hope and freedom as you experience the power and love of God. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please let us know by clicking the link in the comments below. Again, thanks for joining us and have an incredible week.